Starfield background is looking pretty good. Although, if I wanted to, I could go back and change the creation expression to adjust the particle radius. I could also change the other attributes, such as the incandescence or the shader glow. But uh, at this point, I'm ready to sign off on the background. Before I hide it so I can focus in on fluids, I'd like to mention that you don't need to create a particle disk cache for a static particle field like this one. If the particles don't move, you don't need to create a disk cache, nor do you want to. Because in the case of a non-moving particle field, Maya creates a startup disk cache for you automatically. And you'll see that in your particles folder in your project. Now I can proceed. I'll close the render view, select the particles, and in my display layers, I've already got a stars layer. Only the emitter is currently on that layer. I've got the particles selected, and I'll right-click on that stars layer and choose Add Selected Objects. Then I can reference that layer to make it untouchable, and I can toggle the visibility. I'm ready now to create my fluid container. So what are Maya fluids all about? If you open up the Dynamics menu set and go to Fluid Effects, you will see the menus, and in here you'll see things like Create 3D Container, Create 2D Container, Ocean, and Pond. This should give you some idea of what fluids are about. You can create an ocean or a pond, which is a flat plane that has ripples or waves in it, or you can create a container which has a fluid within it that can actually move inside of the container to create plasma effects for fire in this case. Also very good for things like smoke plumes and dust clouds. Today we're just going to create a 3D container with default attributes. And that's constructed right at the origin. I'll tap the spacebar to go out to my four viewport layout so you can see what we've got. In this fluid, we're going to want to have a long oblong box. So I want to warn you at this stage that you do not want to scale the fluid non-uniformly at any time. It is expressly forbidden to have any non-uniform scale values. And I'll go back and set that to a value of 1 in all three scale channels. I also would like to add the fluid to a display layer, like my other scene elements, so I can turn it on and off. So with it selected, I'll go to the display layers and click Create New Layer and Assign Selected Objects. Then I'll double click on that layer name and rename it Fluid Layer. If I try to render my viewport or play in the timeline, I won't see anything happen yet because this is currently an empty container that has no texture either. So we either need to use textures to create a pattern within the container, like you would see in clouds in the sky, for example, or we need to have a dynamic emitter that is actually pushing attributes into the container. So in order to see anything in our viewports at this stage, we need to add an emitter. I've got the container selected. I'll go into the Fluid Effects menu, and under Add Edit Contents, you'll see Emitter. I've just taken the default attributes for the emitter. Now let's rewind and play back and see what that looks like. And now you can see particles appearing in the viewports. So that means the fluid emitter is working. I'll just go ahead and add it to the fluid layer. It's currently selected in the view. I'll right-click the fluid layer and choose Add Selected Objects. So now I can turn these different scene elements on and off as needed. All right, I'm going to maximize the front view. So I'll go over here, click on it, tap the space bar. And I just want to size this box up so that it's approximately the right size. And we can also then make it so that the emitter travels in the opposite direction. We can do a quick render of this, too. We render it from the side view. You'll see that it doesn't look like much yet. 
it's essentially just filling up the container with lots of white goo. And that's the default density moving through the container. Okay, well our first task is to size up the container to be about the right size. And I'll just go ahead and select that container and hit Control A in the Attribute Editor. And in Maya 2011, we now have the excellent checkbox here that says Keep Voxels Square. That refers to voxels, which are cubes within this volumetric container. Voxels need to remain proportional. In other words, they can't be scaled non-uniformly either. I can show you this a little bit better if I go back out to a perspective view. Panels perspective perspective. And we're seeing now just the bottom voxels. But if I want to, I can go into the fluid shape attributes, scroll down, and under display, I can choose different options such as boundary draw. I'll choose reduced. And this might tell you a little bit more about how voxels work. A voxel is a volume element, just like a pixel is a picture element. And what's happening is there's a simulation running in which the emitter is pushing out density into the voxels. And those voxels are connected to one another so that the density is able to flow through them dynamically. If I hit the 5 key on my keyboard, I can sort of see a preview of that. Again, it doesn't look like much just yet. What we want to do is size this box up in order to best take advantage of the available volume. And we don't want to have wasted volume like down here, where there's calculations being done that aren't really necessary. This tutorial, by the way, is compatible with earlier versions of Maya. So you don't have to have 2011 to make it work correctly. But if you don't have 2011 and you don't have this keep voxels square, then you just have to make sure that the resolution and size are all proportional. So in other words, if the resolution is double the size, then it needs to be double the size in all three axes, X, Y, and Z. But in 2011, it's very easy for me to size this up without having to sweat over it too much. With this switch turned on, I don't get stretching voxels. So what I want is a taller container. So in the y-axis, maybe I'll give it 40 units. That might even be too much. Let's try 20. And in the other two axes, it can be narrower. So maybe I'll give it 5 in x and 5 in z. It looks a little bit funny here, as you note. It looks as if it's stretched, but don't be deceived. This switch is our savior, and that's going to make sure that it's going to maintain uh, a consistent shape to the fluid. See, when I rewind, it sort of refreshes the view, and now we can see what we're getting better. We're seeing just a very primitive approximation of a dynamic fluid right now. If I increase the base resolution up to, let's say, 20, and rewind, it'll start to look better, but of course it'll calculate more slowly. I'm going to grab that container and move it down so that it's partially covering the bottom of the rocket. And the emitter, then, I'll rewind to frame 1 and move the emitter up. So we want to make sure we get the emitter selected and not the container. If you have trouble with that, you can go into Window Outliner, and you'll see Fluid 1, and the emitter is a child of Fluid 1. There we go. So I'll move it up to the basic same location as that light. Rewind and playback. The emitter is going upward. We want it to flow downward. So finally, we're going to select that container node and hit Control A to go to the attributes. And scroll down through many attributes. And 
we're looking under contents details, density, buoyancy. This will let us control the flow so that our density will flow downward instead of upward. So I can set that to a negative value, like negative 1. Rewind and play back. And now you'll see it's flowing downward instead of up. Good. We're at a good place to save. I'll go to the File menu and choose Save Scene as Fluids Rocket 03.